Hi everyone, we're just, uh, we're just waiting for the, the virtual room to fill up. It seems to be a few people just filtering through. Um, we're almost there. Great. Well, well um, welcome everyone to this conflict security and development uh, research group talk. Um, I'm Kieran Mitten, uh, a reader um, in conflict security and development at King's. Um, and I am very pleased to welcome back uh, someone who's spoken uh, before at our department um, and a good friend of the course, well, we consider him a friend. I don't know if it's mutual, uh, <laughs> Roger McGinty. Uh, Director of the Durham Global Security Institute and Professor in the School of Government and International Affairs at Durham University. Uh, Roger is going to talk to us about um, his recent book, his new book, Everyday Peace, um, which is not available, I've been informed, on the King's catalogue, but hopefully soon will be. Um, but we're going to share a link as well if you're interested in uh, grabbing a copy of the book. Um, there, are, there are various talks um, Roger could have given to us today, um, and there was there was another topic that sounded fascinating, which I hope perhaps in future, Roger, you can come speak to us about. Um, but we thought this uh, topic of your book in particular is really relevant um, to our department and certainly to our main uh, CSD course. Um, it's an area that a lot of people will be fascinated by and interested in, and some will have experience of having worked in um, peace building or development on the ground um, and might have some experiences of the things you've talked about or certainly want to learn about them. So thank you very much for joining us today from um, from Northern Ireland. Um, and the the way this is going to work, Roger will speak um, around about 30 to 40 minutes um, and then we will go to questions. Um, if you have a question, um, the best way to do this is for you to type the question into the Q&A box. So please type into the Q&A box not into the chat. Um, and then I will do my best to uh, go through those questions and put them directly to Roger. Um, and we might not be able to get through all of them, but I'll, I'll try and group them together if there's similar questions. So, Roger, over to you. Thank you very much, Kieran, And um, thank you very much to King's for the invitation. And thank you very much, everyone who is attending. I see. Um, Lots of names I, I recognize amongst the, the attendees, former students, people I have uh, had the pleasure of working with, people I've bumped into at conferences, um, people I would love to bump into at conferences uh, if, if we can get back there. Um, so thank you and welcome. What I'm going to do really is talk about a number of ideas that are rattling around in my head at the moment. And I'd really welcome your feedback on those. I'd really welcome um, a, you pointing out where I could join the dots. Um, some of these ideas have been rattling around in my head for a long time, and some of them are, are reasonably recent ideas. And, and knowing some of the people in, in the room, I'm aware of, of their expertise, both theoretical and conceptual, but also their, their case study knowledge as, as well. And essentially this, this is a book talk and I'm, I'm, I'm plugging my book and I imagine my horror when I checked the King's uh, uh, library catalog yesterday and, and found the book, was, an e-version of the book was, was not available. Um, but Kieran assures me that, that he will um, remedy that. Okay, so I'm going to show a, a PowerPoint, um, a very simple PowerPoint, and I will talk, I guess. So if we, if you can remember the, uh, the book cover, it's of a dandelion growing through cracks in a concrete pavement. And for a long time, I, I, I've been playing with the, this quotation from the psychogeographer Ian Sinclair, who talked about the tough fecundity of the margins. And he's talking, in his case, he's talking about the wild flowers that grow in the motorway 
verge uh, along the side of the motorway, or rather beautiful weeds that grow and colonize waste ground. And that's what I reckon is conflict disruption, is a way in which the norm of conflict is disrupted by something that takes an opportunity that seizes a moment. Hence the cover of my, my book is this dandelion growing. A, a dandelion is, is usually considered a weed and it's growing um, on the margins and, and thriving on the margins. So what I'm interested in is peace, mercy, solidarity that crops up in unlikely places, in unexpected spaces. And I see conflict disruption as those small acts, stances, or forms of communication that can be pro-peace and pro-social in a context that is usually described as divided or at conflict. And we're familiar with terms like conflict resolution, conflict transformation, conflict management, but I'm interested in conflict disruption. What disrupts conflict and allows something else to happen? And sometimes that something else could be worse than what went before, but sometimes that something else could be better, could actually interrupt, disrupt the conflict allow for pro-social, pro-peace activities to happen. So I'm interested in these transgressions against the dominant narrative of conflict. I'm interested in the micro-sociological, the intimate, the interpersonal, things that happen on the ground between people, the small acts of kindness, of toleration, that happen in the street, in the village, on public transport, in deeply divided societies in which conflict is bubbling underneath, or in situations in which conflict has ceased or the main conflict has ceased, but communities have to work out how they can interact. Now, what I'm talking about generally does not change the strategic outcome, but it can save lives, it can improve lives, it can lead to a change in life's chances and life circumstances. And the first main point I would like to make is that conflict is not totalizing, but it often seems as though it is totalizing. And we're familiar with this picture. It's from a, a shipyard in Germany in the 1930s, and everyone here is, is giving a Nazi salute, um, except this man, uh, who is in a sea of, of um, uh, people giving the, the salute, and he's the holdout. He's not convinced. Yet, the image that we have very often of societies undergoing conflict is that the conflict is totalizing. And of course, conflict actors make it, invest a lot of effort into saying that conflict is totalizing, that the entire population is mobilized, that the entire population buys into the narrative, that everyone is loyal to the cause. And of course, the language that we use reinforces this notion of the totality of conflict, the all encompassing nature of conflict. You know, how, how we use terms like the Palestinians, the Israelis, as though they are all the same. There is no variation, or even the war, as though it is a, 
almost a homogenous um, temporal period of all out conflict. Yet within that, there might be spaces of calm or relative calm. And that's what I'm interested in, in terms of conflict disruption. I'm interested in these spaces, opportunities for resistance, for alternatives, for dissent from the apparently homogenous totalizing notion that conflict is all consuming, all encompassing, homogenous. Okay. And another point I'd like to make is to encourage us to think about power and agency. And we're aware of orthodox views of power and agency. The orthodox view of power is a rather narrow version of power, but it's widely accepted. And that is power over, a coercive power, making someone do something they would rather not. It's a disciplining form of power. And we see this through men with guns. We see this through um, the, 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 the violent disciplining of people. We can see some dreadful pictures coming out of Afghanistan of the, of the Taliban enforcing their, their will through whipping people, through coercing people. Um, but also there are more subtle forms of discipline. And we're implicated in, in all of those, um, you know, and they surround us, these forms of discipline, and we buy into them whether we want to or not. So, you know, we can barely move without CCTV following us. And of course, that disciplines us, disciplines us that we won't take particular actions, that we won't do particular things. And with this, there is moral pressure to conform. There is um, an unspoken uh, disciplining effect. So we're aware of this coercive power and we buy into it. We're aware that the state can do all sorts of things to us. It can jail us, it can fine us, it can strip us of all sorts of opportunities and rights. But whilst that sort of power gets a lot of attention, I want to remind us of other forms of power, more emancipatory, liberated forms of power that are open to us, that we often overlook. These are, rather than power over, it would be good if we think of power to, power with, power from. And we need to take these alternative types of power seriously. We need to think about them on the same level as we think about men with guns, who often look pathetic and ridiculous, I often think. So we need to think of compassion and mercy and solidarity, not as, you know, somehow voluntaristic acts. We need to think of them as power, as forms of power that, and agency that people decide to use. And I think if we think of this as a form of power, it's actually quite liberating. It, it allows the so-called powerless to see themselves as having power. And of course, these forms of power are subtle. You know, think about the power of most Iraqis and most Afghans over the past 20 years. I mean, most of them were not in full support of the regimes in their capital cities. And at the same time, most of them were not members of resistance organizations. Most of them were getting on with life, raising kids, working, getting educated, looking after elders, trying to have fun if they could. But they did one important thing, and it was a form of power. They waited. They waited in the long grass. First the Iraqis waited until 
Western powers left. And so did many Afghans as well. And there was a wonderful line from one of the Taliban negotiators who said when Western powers were withdrawing from Kabul, he said, you have watches, we have time. And I think it's, it's worth thinking about that in terms of power, in terms of ontology, in terms of how we see life and how we live life. That if we can think of many of the actions that we have as a, as a form of power, then it helps us put, put that orthodox power into perspective. Also important when I think about conflict disruption is timing and opportunity. The ability of individuals and communities to read the room, to have the emotional intelligence, to have the psychological awareness, to see what will work, what is feasible and what's not feasible. Thus, you know, there are particular times. For example, I'm thinking about violence that was in Beirut last week. There are particular times when you can seize the moment to talk to and pursue a friendship and interests with someone from the other identity group. And there are times when you don't, when it's best to keep hunkered down. It's best to stay off the streets. It's best not to seize that moment. So crucial to conflict disruption is the ability to seize those moments, the ability to read those situations and work out what's feasible and not feasible. And very often that requires that localized, grounded, contextual knowledge, something that outsiders very often struggle to have. And then also very important, I think, in terms of conflict disruption is the ability to see peace and conflict as a system. I mean, we're used to having peace, space and space conflict as two separate words. But to me, it makes sense to ram these together because they constitute this very large, very complex dynamic system. And there's great work emerging out there from Cedric de Conning, from Garoud Miller and many others that's seeing conflict, peace and conflict as a system. So we could see, I would suggest peace and conflict as an integrated multi-scalar system that's connected. Even the micro sociological that I'm interested in, the things that happen in the queue in the bake, for the bakery, on the public transport system, in the stairwell, in the apartment block in a city like Moston. That, those micro in interactions are still part of this wider system that constitutes the micro and the macro and everything in between, that constitutes the tactical and the strategic and everything in between. And conflict disruption happens on the margins. It happens when judged safe. Often it's inconsistent. Just because someone takes a prisoner on the battlefield rather than engage in a summary execution does not mean that that person who took the prisoner, who made that snap decision, it doesn't mean they're a traitor. It doesn't mean that they have lost all of their beliefs linked to the conflict. Human beings are wonderfully inconsistent. What I believe now, I might change my mind by dinner time. I might change my mind tomorrow. Certainly the 20 year old Roger had very different beliefs and interests and views than the one now. So these minor acts are all part of the wider system that top-down international relations sees. 
But these minor acts are co-constitutive of that system. They are formative of that system. And it's, it's worth having this systemic view. Okay, so let me move on to the notion of conflict disruption. And we're familiar with the notion of disruption from markets. Uh, you may have heard of the uh, Austrian economist Schumpeter and his ideas of creative disruption, of how a new player, a new product can come along into the market and upset that market. And we're very familiar with that. Netflix and other streaming services are disrupting the traditional uh, broadcasters. EasyJet and other so-called low-cost airlines are disrupting what are called legacy airlines. And we're familiar with this, how new entrants to the market do things differently. They offer new services at different prices. They um, offer new products. They exploit new markets. And in doing so, they change the market. It's not a case that they're bolt-ons to the existing market. They change the entire market. It's dynamic. It's structural. So we're used to new, in the commercial world, we're used to new market entrants who seize the moment, who um, change the market. And then examples of this conflict disruption, and when going through these examples, it's useful to think about scale. So is this happening at the micro level, the macro level? Is it happening in the stairwell of an apartment block on public transport? Or is it happening at an elite political level? It's also worth thinking about the location and reminding ourselves of how much of our studies are focused on capital cities, but also focused on locations rather than networks. And I think we need to reorientate how we look at peace and conflict to, to prioritize networks rather than static places. And also it's worth thinking about the potential of these stances, acts and forms of communication to disrupt conflict. So examples of conflict disruption, well, things like taking prisoners on the battlefield rather than executing someone. And there, there are lots of examples if you read autobiographies, for example, from World War I, in which snap decisions were made rather to take a prisoner. And that prisoner usually had a very miserable time in prison. But after the war, if they were fortunate, they went on to live very full lives. And that could have been ended by dispatching that prisoner, by shooting that, that prisoner, which was extraordinarily common in both World Wars I and II. Um, much more common than official narratives of, of, of those wars suggest. But that relied on some level of sociality, that the person taking the prisoner realized this is another human being. I don't agree with them politically. I've been trained to regard them as the enemy, but I can see that we're fellow human beings. And also there may have been an element of reciprocity there. If we take prisoners rather than shoot them, then if I find myself at gunpoint later on in this war, then I might be lucky enough to be taken prisoner. We can also think of remarkable friendships across identity boundaries, friendships that have survived political and security pressure. And there are lots of those, lots of these that deserve our attention. Um, really profound lasting friendships that act as exemplars 
to others in the community. Friendships that managed to survive when other communities, other, other, when the rest of the community is perhaps um, retreating back into its single identity bunker. Or we can think of intergroup marriage in deeply divided societies, marriage between um, people who identify differently in terms of ethnicity or, or, or language in the former Yugoslavia, in um, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, many other places. Other things that disrupt conflict, whistleblowing on authoritarianism or militarism that might show, for example, that there is a lot of coercion behind the scenes, that not everyone buys into the, nation, the, the notion of the United Nation. Back-channel feelers between enemies in which they're working out um, the extent to which the other side could be persuaded to investigate negotiation rather than conflict. Also, we can think of localized ceasefires. Um, there were very many of these in Syria, which were in a sense unofficial. Many of them were humanitarian, um, short lived, but reciprocal and important in disrupting this notion of all out conflict, this notion that conflict is totalizing, that everyone on one side speaks and thinks with the one mind. Other examples of conflict disruption include the family in deeply divided society. When you think about it, the family is the most important political unit on the planet. And it's a pity that political science and international relations is so resistant to that idea. The family is where most of us gain our moral compass and it's where most of us get formative political ideas. And it's where many of us are radicalized and militarized, but it's also a site in some families where there is restraint, where that stern auntie or uncle chides the children and makes them think twice about radicalization, makes them think twice about joining that gang or joining that militia or joining that march. Conflict disruption comes in the form of tolerance or promotion of alternative narratives and explanations. And sometimes that can be incredibly brave. If you're growing up in a deeply divided society in which you're educated separately, you play separately, you engage in culture, culture separately, you shop separately, in which every conversation is an echo chamber for someone to say, well, there might be a different way of thinking about this. It's actually a huge act of resistance, of dissent. It requires a lot of bravery. There could be tolerance of non-singular identities. There could be an, a shared interest that transcends the main societal fault line. So for example, if you go to Belfast on a Saturday afternoon, Belfast is a deeply divided city in which the vast majority of people live in mainly Catholic areas, or mainly Protestant areas. The vast, vast majority of school kids go to all Catholic schools or all Catholic or all Protestant schools. You know, this is the main fault line in society. Yet, if you go to Belfast City Hall or the area around it on a Saturday afternoon, you'll see hundreds of, of skater kids, kids with skateboards. Um, who are both Catholic and Protestant, and whose main interest is not, at least for those hours, identifying as Catholic, Nationalist, or Protestant, Unionist. Their main interest is 
trying to flirt with other boys and girls and making a nuisance of themselves uh, with pedestrians and, and traffic. So we can see this in many other places where, where some sort of cultural out, outlet uh, following a particular type of music or a particular cultural genre um, transcends the main fault line. We can see no shoot zones in US cities, Baltimore, for example, um, in which there's round about one a murder a day um, linked to gang violence or, or, or narcotics related crime. Uh, in which local uh, community members, often ex-gang members, set up no, no, no shoot zones. We've seen zones of peace in many Latin American and Central American countries, in, for example, Mexico or Colombia, in which villagers post notices saying, if you want to come into this village, don't bring your gun. And that's a really brave thing to say to a guerrilla, to a paramilitary, or to a member of the state armed forces. Or we can see in some societies integrated education where kids um, who are from different identity backgrounds are educated together. And lots of brave, unexpected gestures by political leaders and many others. So for example, when South Africa, very shortly after the fall of apartheid, um, hosted the Rugby World Cup, Nelson Mandela um, was there and he wore a, a Springboks jersey. Um, the Springboks, the South African rugby team, have been associated very much with, with white South Africa. And he was making a statement that everyone is part of this South Africa. Okay, let me wrap up in, in a few minutes. Um, you can read a bit more about conflict disruption here, it's in the Journal of Intervention and Peacebuilding. Fundamentally, this is a book, a book talk. Um, so please do email Kieran as course convener and get him to um, purchase the book, the e-version of, of the book. But what are the takeaways from this? Um, the first is, I think we really need to see peace and conflict as constituting a system and then to identify moments within that system in which the conflict narrative, the logic, the totalizing nature of the conflict can be disrupted, even very slightly. And that might encourage a recalibration of the conflict. Sometimes that could go wrong, it could go very badly, but it could go right. So, for example, you know, one thing that could be done would be to treat for the international community, and I'm thinking maybe of conflict actors in Yemen, for the UN and other interested parties to treat the conflict actors with much less respect, rather than the monthly visit by a UN special representative in which there, there is much politeness and much... Um, a formality, treat these conflict actors with the respect that they deserve, which isn't very much, and undercut their identity rather than reinforce their identity, knock them off their feet. And there are lots of examples, I think, of how the international community and conflict interested actors actually can change the narrative, can change uh, the logic. Because conflict disruption under the right circumstances can lead to something else, something more than an interruption. It can disrupt, and that might lead to conflict resolution, management, or transformation. And much of this is based on optimism and hope. Much of this is based on, on um, me hoping that good things would happen. But I think it's important that we create space, that we puncture the totalizing myth of conflict, that we expose the myth of the homo homogenous unity between conflict, uh, within conflict groups. 
and pay recognition to these small acts of kindness, of mercy, of humility, of solidarity, of sociality, of reciprocity that we can find in, in what I call everyday peace. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing there and I really look forward to, to discussion and rather than just a Q&A, I'd be really interested to hear what you think as well. Brilliant, thanks Roger. Um, yeah, re really interesting stuff, um, particularly found it interesting what you were saying about the, the family unit and the neglect of that in a lot of uh, conflict studies, political science studies. Um, and I think there will be, I think in, in a couple of comments already, there are there's some interesting questions raised. I should also uh, say um, I have requested the book again from the library, so don't all email me. Roger's involved in a bit of everyday conflict provocation there. Um, I, um, I think I want to, the first question I want to take, Daniel's asked a question which essentially is, is getting at the, um, the nature of, the, of an armed group in a conflict. And he's asking whether or not um, it matters whether ordinary people can disrupt conflict if the armed group is benign, maybe that gives opportunity, but what happens where they're more repressive or more um, aggressive, antagonistic? Um, is that an important factor? And perhaps we'll start there and then there's a couple of others we'll come to in a moment. Uh, hello, Daniel. Um, uh, yes, it is uh, important. And, uh, you know, we, we can think of very many situations in which, a, in which it would be foolhardy for people to dissent, to be seen to dissent from um, the notion that everyone is supportive of an armed group. The, these, these groups... Um, can be extraordinarily violent. Much of their activity is not based on facing the enemy. Instead, it's, it's, it's directed towards disciplining the in-group and thus to um, put your head above the parapet, quite literally, and suggest that there is another way. Um, might be very dangerous. But at the same time, the people who are very best placed to disrupt, uh, to spot the opportunities for challenging the notion that the armed group represents everyone. The people who are best placed to do that are precisely um, the support base, are precisely the community. And one thing that, that communities are, are very good at spotting is how those groups and individuals who claim to represent them are either too far ahead in making concessions or too far behind in not realizing that things have changed. Um, and, and people realize how things have changed through their everyday life, through what they recognize. Oh, it's safe to shop there now. It's safe to use that bus route. Oh, um, I was able to, to walk there and do you know what? Other people are walking there. So I think I'll be able to do that or I'll advise my friends to do that. Um, you know, it wasn't as bad uh, as I thought. They're cleaning that, that graffiti um, and it, it, the streetscape is not as intimidating as it used to be. So I think it, it really does come down to this issue of the emotional intelligence so-called ordinary people who have amazing, um, extraordinary skills of diplomacy, their ability to read a situation and um, to make decisions on, on, on the basis of that. You know, we hear a lot about this term conflict sensitive, that, you know, we have to be conflict sensitive researchers. The most conflict sensitive people are those living in deeply divided societies or societies coming out of conflict because they, very often realize what's feasible and what's not feasible, what's safe and what's not safe. But a, a, a really good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Laura, Laura Martin. Uh, hi, Laura, has, has asked this question. I'm just going to read this one out. Uh, your talk has made me think about the notion of signals in divided societies, namely those small things that signal otherness within a society like Northern Ireland that an outsider might not necessarily recognize. Uh, whether a name or a piece of jewellery. 
In thinking through these signals, only those societies really or truly know them, could this be considered disruptive and even uniting? A uh, great question, Laura, and hello, and congratulations on, on, on your job uh, as well. Um, uh, yes, it, it, it very much gets back to, to the, the last point and the ability of, of others, uh, the, the ability of people living through the conflict to read those signals, many of which are very subtle, um, many of which are um, so subtle that out, outsiders don't see them. And, and one thing that um, is, is very noticeable is, are those signals in a way, those single identity signals. I, I'm currently in Northern Ireland where it's very easy, not very easy, but often easy to read the sectarian identity of people by what they wear, you know, by, by the football tops that, that they're wearing, etc. And there are times that you just wouldn't wear that, you know, if, if you had any sense of uh, any self-awareness, um, because it wouldn't be safe for you to go into particular places. But then there are the signals that um, are transgressive of that, the signals that you're open to the other side, the signals that you've actually moved beyond the conflict. Um, and those could be, you know, as subtle as the newspaper you choose to buy and you could be seen walking from the shop with it. They could be as subtle as the radio station that, that, that you're listening to. Um, all of these tiny little micro signals then come together and pattern society and make up the narrative. And if you think about society, it's, it's full of signaling and a hell of a lot of noise. But it's interesting, it's just got me thinking, Laura, and thank you for, for, for doing that. It, you know, if you think about a society and, and the dominant signaling, you know, from, from, you know, I'm thinking about say Beirut and the dominant sig signaling from and for Shia, and the dominant signaling uh, from and for Sunni and for all of the other groups as well, you know, each has their bandwidth. But what about that signaling that is saying, to hell with that, <laughs> like, you know, is, is there some sort of common signaling, some sort of music that transcends that, some sort of issue that transcends that? In Beirut some years ago, it was, um, the, the rubbish crisis, the, the, the crisis that, that none of the political parties uh, and the government could not take the refuge or the rubbish away. And that made citizens of all political hues and identities very cross indeed. And for a moment, people did come together. And that was very overt signaling. But what an interesting idea. I'll, I'll think a bit more about that, Laura. Thank you. Um, I'll combine a couple of questions here. I think it will just be two questions, but, but the three that have been posted. So first of all, Chris Wilson was saying, from personal experience working with people in Ethiopia and South Sudan, it can be very difficult to motivate groups of people to engage in conflict disruption. Conflict disrupting active, activities often seem pointless in the face of huge conflict. So then he says, how would you encourage a group who felt this way? And I think it also um, links with uh, Florence's question. Is there anything that external actors can do to promote this local and micro disruption, particularly thinking about interests that transcend societal faults or promoting intergroup networks? So it, it seems to be a bit of a question about is this something organic? Is this something that can be instigated externally or even inter internally? I, I think they're, they're really good questions and, and they're coming from good places as well, because, you know, if a conflict can be disrupted, well, why wouldn't you? Um, particularly if, if, if the outcome uh, would be saving and improving lives. But as, as both uh, Chris and, and Florence point out, this can be dangerous, um, very dangerous indeed. Uh, my first answer would be not to intervene, would be that it's very often local people can sit, spot those opportunities much better than outsiders, they can um, spot 
a, what is safe to do and what is not safe to do. They can spot what they can get away with and what might bring discipline, uh, disciplining actions or words from their own side. If I think about acts of conflict disruption, which are usually extraordinarily subtle forms of dissent, such as a former lending someone from the outgroup their labor or some tools, these things happen organically, usually. They're part of the rhythm of the society. And it's difficult for that to be projectized and turned in, into a program. And from my, my reading of, of these situations, very often conflict disruption, particularly at the local level, is affected by individuals rather than by organizations. And I'm, I'm struck by the effectiveness of the level beneath civil society organizations. In other words, charismatic individuals in a community who through their actions and their words are change makers. They're social entrepreneurs. They're not, they, they don't have a white four by four and they don't have a CSO. Instead, they are a CSO <laughs> in themselves. And they do things like establishing a boxing club um, uh, that kids from different communities can come to. They, uh, you know, have a good word to say about the other side. So to the extent that outsiders would want to help, my suggestion, and I know it's really difficult and unhelpful if you're, <laughs> if you're working for a foreign ministry or something, is to back individuals rather than organizations. Um, uh, to me, those are the real change makers at the local level um, who uh, through their micro actions are actually affecting the greatest change and often are way ahead of political leaders and cr open up that space then that low level political leaders realize is free and possibly can, can move into. So it's unfortunately, it's, it's not a, it's not a simple answer. It's one based on, on backing individuals and, and recognizing that most of these changes are actually very organic. Yeah, um, we have, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two questions. Um, the first is um, from anonymous commenter who says, thank you for your talk. What challenges have you faced in measuring or documenting, um, observing these micro dynamics? Um, and then there's a question from Kyla. And thanks so much for the fascinating presentation. You used the lovely example of Nelson Mandela wearing the Springbok jersey at the 95 World Cup, Rugby World Cup, as an unexpected and uniting gesture. Could you talk a bit more about how you see conflict disruption in terms of transitional justice? Does it have a greater role to play? And if so, what would conflict disruption in transitional justice settings look like? Hmm. Oh, that's difficult. Um, that's a really good question. Um, the, the first one on, on measuring and observing um, uh, is an opportunity for me to plug the Everyday Peace Indicators, which you can check out at everydayapeaceindicators.org. And for 10 years or so, I've been working with a, a magnificent scholar in, in the United States, Pamina Fershaw, and we've been measuring these, these micro changes in uh, in communities, in numerous uh, locations, in uh, communities in South Africa, Zimbabwe, South Sudan, Uganda, uh, Colombia, many other places. And rather excitingly, uh, we're starting doing it in, in a couple of cities in the United States, cities that have seen uh, citizen police violence of late. So that is one way. The other way, and it's, it's very much in the book that Kieran has ordered for the KCL library, I'm assured, um, is I, I spent a long time reading um, World War I and World War II diaries and autobiographies. And I would say two things. 
The first is, it is absolutely stunning how peace and conflict studies, contemporary peace and conflict studies, actually pays very little attention to anything that happened before 1989. Um, and, and when I was reading these memoirs and autobiographies, they were actually packed with lessons, uh, observations of these microdynamics of giving food to prisoners, giving water to prisoners, to um, statements like, you know, I hate the Nazis, but I can recognize that, you know, not, not every German is a Nazi, all sorts of things. So, so I would, I would um, recommend us actually looking at, at memoirs, diaries, autobiographies to see these micro um, sociological uh, instances of conflict disruption. Um, and of course, there are lots of, of, of blogs, etc., coming out of, of more contemporary uh, conflicts. The, the question on how can we see conflict disruption in transitional justice, I, again, I go back to these, um, to these micro sociological events that are really happening in the village, in the apartment block, in the um, queue, you know, in the cafe, in, in a town, in a village where people of different groups are living. And I'm I guess, and the questioner could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the focus on transitional justice is on formal activities, um, is on judicial processes, is on right sizing and reforming um, the judiciary. My main focus is on the very local and the almost intimate and, and interpersonal. But I think there, we have lots of opportunities for forgiveness, for moving on, for contrition, uh, for what my first employer and mentor and, and, and sadly missed a wonderful scholar, John Darby called, um, the weak smile and the hard swallow, in which I know that the guy down the, down the street was responsible for some bags, bad stuff that killed or injured my brother. I don't like him. I'm never going to be his bestie, but I can live in this, reconcile with living in the same street with him. So in a, say, in a sense, I think that a lot of truly organic, highly localized, transitional and transformational justice goes on in communities. It doesn't involve formal acts of um, reconciliation or judicial processes or am amnesty. In a sense, people issue an amnesty by getting on with life and interacting with the other, shopping in the same corner store as them. Um, it doesn't involve the big statement, the grand gesture, it's those micro actions. So, so I, in a way, I think it's, it's micro level transitional and transformational justice in action, um, rather than a, the sort of large capital um, transitional justice. Thanks. Uh, just to remind you if, you, if you have questions, put them in the, in the Q&A box uh, rather than the chat. That would be super. Um, a, a couple of questions, I think, that they're kind of linked um, along the same lines. Uh, Laura Mitchell, um, following on Laura Martin's comments, was asking, I was saying, are you, is what you're getting at really about disruptive practices, perhaps not exclusively, but practices which disrupt or undermine conflict and polarizing pressures? And then Hinardo was asking a question. You mentioned the rubbish crisis in Lebanon people lending labor or tools. Would you say that basic necessity is the strongest driver of these behaviors? So I guess it's about the nature of, of the behaviors or the practices you're talking about. And in, in Hanada's case in particular, is it something to do with when it just becomes a, a basic necessity that you, you tend to get this? Hmm. Um, those are good questions. Um, to Laura, I'm, I'm talking about uh, practices and actions and stances. I, I think 
it would be very good for peace and conflict to pay more attention to the notion of stance as well as action. Um, uh, you know, actions very often we can see them um, and, and they're easier to identify and to study, but also it's worth paying attention to a stance, to a set of beliefs and how that translates into how you live, who you welcome into your house, who you socialize with, the language that we you use. And fundamentally, as um, the sociologist John Brewer has, has made clear, um, everyday peace and disruption is a logic as well. It's a, it's a mode of thinking. Um, in terms of whether this manifests itself more easily in times of necessity or, or when people need to access uh, or meet basic needs, I think a little. Um, but actually, I think what makes this more, these forms of conflict disruption more noteworthy is that people don't have to think this way. They don't have to take these actions. Um, there is a voluntaristic nature to them. There is a sense of putting your head above the parapet, of standing against the tide. There could be an element of bravery in this. Um, so, so I think the driver actually it would be sociality, the recognition that other people who identify differently from me are human as well. There may be an element of self-interest in terms of reciprocity. I do something for you in the hope and expectation that you will return the favor. And also there may be an element of solidarity, um, uh, uh, standing with the other because you recognize there is righteousness in their cause or in their being you know i'm thinking of of all of those people who um for example stand with refugees and migrants who go out of their way to help whether it's giving free legal advice or shelter or or, or material assistance etc so so there certainly could be an element of of basic need but i think this actually goes a little beyond that. Great. Uh, there's a, an excellent question here from, from Kathleen Jennings. Hi, Kathleen. Uh, I'm going to read it out in full. Um, the point about conflict not being totalizing is an important corrective to those macro or broad brush perspectives on conflict. At the same time, uh, and echoing the question we had before about symbols and signals in conflict disruption, at the micro or everyday level, there seems to be a strong connection between conflict and identity. If the football kit you wear or the store you shop in or the school you go to, et cetera, it's not just connected to you, but it's constitutive of your identity and your place in the world. And these are necessarily understood implicitly or explicitly in relation to that conflict. Then how isn't this also a totalizing experience? Can you talk through that tension between conflict not being totalizing where everyday conflict itself is constitutive, if you could pronounce that word, Roger, that would really do me a favour, of identity. Hello, Kathleen. Very uh, good to hear from you. And, um, you know, since you're in Norway, uh, the, the islands that we're in, we're always, well, we always welcome humanitarian aid from um, advanced nations like, like Norway. Um, it's a really good question. And I think it, it gets back to this issue that, that, human beings are not designed to have one identity. We're not designed to be consistent. We update like software um, over time. I, we, as I say, we're not consistent. We are awkward. We don't say what people expect us to say. We don't act in ways that people expect us to act. We have the capacity sometimes if the situation allows to subvert to resist to provide alternative narratives so i think the the answer to your question and it's it's one for discussion is very much about the dynamic non-singular nature of identity and how 
okay, I accept that in conflict societies and indeed many societies that lots of people are um, content and encouraged and conditioned to display a single identity, the dominant identity, you know, we're all whatever um, behind the cause uh, and we all, you know, uh, we have our, our passports and believe that we're, we, we share um, something, uh, so, some identity. But I think that conflict disruption is able to take opportunities from those who realize that identity is not singular, that there is space for divergence and difference. And very often, I think this is an age and stage thing. Very often it's linked to a certain level of maturity and experience where people realize that, you know, you know what, the other side aren't that bad. You know, they're not all demons with cloven hooves. They're not all the same. You know, there's yet another political leader saying exactly the same thing and pretending to speak on behalf of me. And, you know, at some stage in life, a lot of people get a bit sick of that. And, you know, I realize that, um, you know, after living through the 15th election in which the base has been sectarianized and the same old divisive um, slogans are employed, that, that perhaps there are alternative ways of thinking. And they observe that, well, hang on, that guy down the road seems quite decent. He seems, you know, although he's politically on the other side, he, you know, helped me out when I needed to change a tire on my car. He helped me out when I was in need. So I think the answer lies in the wonderful inconsistency of, of our identity. Excellent. Um... A couple of questions I will, I will bring together. One um, came early on in your talk, actually, which was about prisons of war. Um, and uh, it was an anonymous comment just asking, is it worth also considering the peaceful acts of those who choose to be captured, as well as those who do, did the capturing? Um, so I assume talking perhaps about the Second World War as an example. Um, rather than continuing to participate in the slaughter, they were often celebrated uh, alongside others with the black poppy. Um, and then Carla asked a question just generally about agency which I think is related there. Um, just wondering if you could say a little bit more about it um, in the context of that discussion. So I guess if you have anything to add about how important agency is. Uh, she says, I'm very interested in what you mentioned regarding agency. I wonder if you could say a bit more about it. Um, uh, yeah, it's a good point on, on, the, um, on the sort of voluntary being taken prisoner um, and I hadn't really thought that much about it, and it it doesn't come up hugely in the in the autobiographies. It it yeah, because very often in the autobiographies, you know, people uh, very often they're written in a, in a way that is obviously it's a bit like you know, social media, no, you know, no one posts a picture of themselves third in the queue at Tesco, you know, it's, it's, it's too dull and it's, it's pathetic. You know, we all have these amazing achievements. So a lot of the autobiographies, um, if someone is taken prisoner, they've fought to the last round, you know, they, they, they've had, have a bayonet in their mouth, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in the case of the German ones, very often it's a case of, um, the those who survived were too busy trying to make their way west in in March and April, um, nineteen forty five. Uh, you know, and and very often they would say, you know, they are avowed anti Nazis, etc. They they never bought into it all. Of course, they would say that, um, but but usually it, their main aim isn't isn't to foreshorten the war. It's to, it's understandably to to save their their skins um but but certainly there are a lot of acts of acts of non-violence in war so for example things like localized ceasefires of not shelling 
the trenches of the other side of firing over, of firing long or firing short, simp on the understanding that the other side will do the same. So they're engaging in the performativity of violence to try to satisfy their generals who are safely in the chateau 15 miles behind the front line, but they are um, uh, they're trying to engage in, in, in reciprocal acts of non-violence. Um, say more about agency. Um, uh, well, if you're a KCL student, I, I'm assured that I, that Kieran has ordered the e-copy of the book and by the end of the week, you'll be able to read, I think, chapter three, which is on power uh, and agency. But I think the key point I would make is that, that it's very useful for us to see those small subtle acts of agency that happen at the level of the individual, the family, the community, not these big ticket, look at me actions by political leaders. And also to, to look at many of these pro, tiny pro-social, pro-peace actions as forms of power. So in the book, I, I call it everyday peace power. In a way, I think peace and conflict studies has to take power away from the, the realists in international relations and to see power uh, all around us or agency all, all around us and, and, and to see it in more emancipatory uh, and liberated ways. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here um, from Catherine McCulloch about uh, today Northern Ireland is often termed as being in a supposedly post-conflict situation. Can you see a way of using the conflict disruption concept as a, of a way as a way of investigating what's going on in societies that are passing from everyday violence to peace? I want to tack on a broader question, um, perhaps for the benefit of, of our students and, and all of us, really. Um, obviously, we'll all be reading your book, Roger, as soon as it's in, in the in the King's Library catalogue, um, or for those that want to want to buy a copy online. Um, and I'm sure in your conclusions, it very neatly sets out the, the key takeaways. But what is it um, ideally that you would like us to take from this? Is it, is it about correcting or, or, or thinking about something in the way we view and understand things and just paying more attention to these processes, these things that perhaps are left out of the existing studies? Or is it also, is there a practical element to this? Is it also about thinking about what should be done or not done? Um, so maybe it's you know anti-intervention or it's, trying to avoid certain interventions, it, it would be helpful to, to, to um, hear what you yeah, have to say on that. Cheers. Yes. Um, hello, Catherine. Uh, Catherine is, is on uh, at the other side of the town, small town in Northern Ireland I'm currently in. We, we've had awful weather today, haven't we? Um, the, uh, I think the basis of the question is very important and we can think about this in terms of many societies you know in in the Balkans and and elsewhere and that is when does a post-conflict society stop being a post-conflict society and become a society and very often the language that we use you know my use of the term post-conflict if I if I talk about if I refer to Mostar as post-conflict Mostar I'm actually reinforcing the conflictness of Mostar so I think the language that we all use in peace and conflict studies um, is unfortunately part of the conflict system and, and often reinforces that. In terms of um, using co conflict disruption uh, as a way of investigating how these societies are um, transitioning, hopefully away from violence and, and, and division, then I think we can see, you know, conflict disruption all around us. We can we can see those actors, those individuals, those groups, those communities that are um, iconoclastic, that are acting against the single identity type, that are taking those small steps that are constitutive of a different way of thinking. So I, I think, you know, we can involve ourselves in conflict disruption spotting or, or, or identifying who the disruptors are or um, 
what those acts of disruption might be. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that, that is easier to spot in hindsight rather than somehow how predict. And of course, with all actions, all social actions, there can be un unintended or unanticipated outcomes. Um, so acts of disruption might actually encourage conflict actors to redouble their conflict e efforts to discipline the in-group, to make an example of someone who, um, a, who has you know, been overly friendly with people from the other side. Um, Rachel's question is, is a very good one and echoes um, a, questions that, that we've had earlier, which is one that pointy-headed academics like myself get, get a lot, which is, you know, nice conceptualization, but what do I, who work in the real world, what am I meant to do with this or, or make, make of it? So it's a, it's a very good, good question. Uh, and, and one that I, I take seriously. I think, first of all, um, I think what the notion of conflict disruption might help with is how we think about conflict. Um, to, th to think about it in a much less linear way, to think about it as a system, um, a peace and conflict system, so it's all integrated. And also to think about those particular moments in which disruption can happen. I think if we have a term for it, we can identify it better and we can identify disruptors. And as I said before, I think, and this is, I guess, particularly because I'm, I'm interested in the micro sociological and in, in the very local, the hyper local, we can identify those individuals who are the disruptors. Um, we can identify those individuals who see peace as a verb as, as well as being a noun who can, um, through their own social entrepreneurship, uh, disrupt the narrative, who can think in different ways, who talk in, in different ways. So I think it really is about identifying individuals at the micro level and backing, in a sense, backing winners. I think, you know, uh, and I'm, I don't know your, your background, Rachel, but I suspect you're probably, you know, extraordinarily well versed in, in conflict management and um, uh, you probably have lots of on the ground experience. But, you know, I don't think we're in the territory of setting up a, you know, conflict disruption institute in, you know, in a deeply divided society uh, or a conflict disruption unit or whatever. Instead, we're, we're thinking about a very responsive form of conflict transformation response that is focused at the, at the hyper-local level, that is experimental, that uh, backs individuals rather than organizations, and also approaches, approaches conflict sideways on rather than directly. So, you know, for example, um, you know, sets up or, or encourages the setting up of that darts group, that women's darts league, rather than um, identifying this as a peace and reconciliation um, initiative. Just get on with the cultural, providing those spaces that can be populated by those who are best placed to spot the opportunities uh, for for those beautiful weeds to grow. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, that might be a good place for us to finish. There was a, a question quite early on, which I neglected to come to. Um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on it, Roger. It was about the the perspective of, of homogeneity that you talked about being false, the idea that society is homogenous, whether that linked to collective punishment. I think you, you maybe kind of covered it as you, as you spoke. But I, I mean, certainly for in, in situations where we can see collective uh, punishment b being meted out to, to, to communities, it is indiscriminate. It, the, whole, the very notion of, of collective uh, punishment um, answers, answers the question. It does not differentiate between um, young or old, the zealot 
and and the moderate. And that's why I think we, we need to be careful with the language we use about the other um, to make sure that, you know, for example, not all Afghans are the same, but how many thousand times in the past week have we heard the category Afghans? Um, Afghanistan is not, it, Afghanistan does not exist as a country, as a nation state. It is an imaginary, just as every country on the planet um, is an imaginary. You know, the United Kingdom is ferociously disunited. The, the notion that a, it can be somehow represented by one individual or one, um, a, one rather short set of pithy phrases is based on, on an imaginary. So I, I think it's, it's worth paying quite a lot of attention to, to the language that, that we use and, and how that can actually reinforce the, the conflicts that, that we're all interested in, in reducing. Excellent. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for your questions, really great questions. Um, and um, yeah, the book will hopefully be available for, for King students and for everyone else. We've put a link in the, in the chat. You can find out more about the book um, there as well. Roger, thanks so much for, for speaking to us. And um, yeah, and we, will, uh, we will hopefully hear from you again in the not too distant future at King's. And um, keep an eye out for your for your upcoming applications and stuff cheers Great. Th thank you very much and thank you everyone for attending and i can see i can see lots of people i know tiffany champe uh ranuk um sorry I'm, I'm name checking but in the olden days i would have a coffee with all of you laura kathleen um dylan hello Din dylan catherine Lots of others. So um, thank you very much for for attending, and I hope to meet you in in person soon. Just to add, just to add, um, the recording will be made available on the War Studies YouTube. So if you um, you loved it so much that you just have to watch it again, um, and you want to share it with others, it will be on the War Studies YouTube channel. Um, so keep an eye out there. Great, and thank you very much, Kieran, for for sharing.